Hi, this is William Wood with Global Awakening. I want to take a few moments and share with you my personal journey to the Lord. And every single one of, one of us has a story. Every single one of us has a journey, a process to the Lord. Well, mine started in Alabama. I grew up in a, in a home where my, both of my parents were, were alcoholics, and I grew up in a drug culture. But not only that, both of my parents were atheists. They taught me that God was not real, and the only time I ever really heard the name Jesus or God was when it was used in a sentence with a curse word. And that was the, really the context of my upbringing. But one of the things that really stuck out to me as an atheist, and one of the reasons that uh, I was an atheist was the fact that I saw a church on every single corner in the state of Alabama. But I don't remember not one time ever remember meeting a Christian, or at least one that blew their cover. And I remember growing up, I would see these churches and I always thought they were funeral homes because it was always a white building and had a cemetery behind it. And I'm thinking, well, I guess you just go there, you die and they put you out there in the backyard somewhere. And so that was kind of my idea of the churches. And, but it also proved a point to me, if God is really real, and if he has really filled his people by his spirit or with his spirit, then where are they? Why don't they live different than the rest of us live? Why don't they demonstrate that God is real? And so for me, it really hardened my heart even more toward the concept of God to the point it was pushing me into a, a lifestyle of alcohol, a lifestyle of drugs beginning at the age of 12. And when you have a void in your heart, you're going to try to fill that void with something. You, you see, pain is always directed to something. If your pain isn't directed to God, it will be directed to something in your life. And that's exactly what I was doing with my pain. That's what I was doing with my hurt is I was directing it toward what I knew because the culture of my life was drugs. It was alcohol. I, I live right down the street from some drug dealers. So I began to uh, do drugs at the age of 12. By the time that I was 15 years old, I was living in and out of uh, crack houses. And at the age of 20, I had this supernatural encounter that changed my life. And it happened actually right after I overdosed on drugs. I had been up for five solid days on drugs without sleep. I was walking along the side of the road and I began to overdose. When I overdosed, I fell into the highway. A car hits me, knocked me off into the ditch. The next time I wake up, I'm in a hospital. And the do doctors are looking at me. They say, William, your kidneys have completely failed and your liver is failing on you. Matter of fact, if we cannot get your kidneys and your liver to function properly, you may die. And this is kind of what the doctors told me. Because of the, the size of the town that I grew up in was a town of about 2,000 people, the hospital that I was at wasn't necessarily capable of handling my situation. So they sent me to another hospital two hours, three hours away. I get there, they put me in intensive care, and every single night I begin to have this thought, I hope I'll wake up to see tomorrow. Now remember, I'm an atheist at this point. I don't believe in God. I think it's all foolishness. So I wasn't in the hospital crying out to Jesus. I wasn't asking him to come save me. I wasn't asking him to heal me. I thought all of that was just foolishness. And so I was in intensive care for two weeks. Every single day, I don't know if I'm gonna wake up. And every single night, I have this thought, I hope I wake up to see the next day. Well, after two weeks of being in the hospital, I had this thought, and before I closed my eyes to go to sleep, all of a sudden, a bright light formed right in front of my hospital bed. Now, to be honest with you, I've done a lot of drugs in my life. I thought I was going back on another trip, you know, just to be honest with you. But there was something different about this light. It was an atmosphere that this light carried. It was a glory, there was a, a love and a presence to this light that I could not explain. So I began to focus at this light. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it's the size of a person. And then all of a sudden I began to see a figure of a person, a figure of a man walking toward me through this light. And so I lean into this light and I'm looking at it. What in the world is happening? Within just a few seconds, a man steps through the light into the hospital room where I am laying. He has a white gown on, he has brown hair. His face was lit up with such light. I couldn't see the features of it because there was just so much light from his face. But as soon as he stepped into the room, my body begins to tremble, just like this under the power, under this power, just, just trembling, trembling. At the same time, there was so much love accompanying with this power that I knew whoever this guy is, He's not here to hurt me. He's here to help me somehow. 
He walks right to the foot of my bed. He doesn't say anything to me. He turns like he's going to walk out the door. Instead, he sits down on the floor. He crosses his legs and he holds his hands like this sitting in the floor. And I'm looking at this and you may be wondering right now, like, okay, when well, you say you're seeing these things, is, is this an aspect of your imagination or are you vis visibly seeing this with your physical eyes? I'm seeing this with my physical eyes. Just like you see a person, I'm seeing this with my physical eyes. And I'm seeing this man, he's sitting over there with his hands like this, sitting in the floor. And he turns over and he looks it to the right side of the room. So I look over the right side of the room. When I do, the wall opens up, a river of water begins to flow from the wall into the room right in front of where this man is sitting. He sticks his hands in this water. He begins to wash his arms. He begins to clean himself. And an audible voice says this, the waters that you see will purify and cleanse you if you receive Jesus the Christ as Lord and Savior. And as soon as I heard that voice speak to me, something inside of me just resounded with this yes. And I just screamed out, yes, to this voice. Now, let me just stop right here for a moment. Remember, I'm an atheist. I've never even heard the name Jesus spoken to me. Never, not once in my life, or at least that I can remember. I never even heard the gospel before in my life. And so now my first intro, uh, introduction to this is Jesus himself walking into my room, sitting there, and the audible voice is calling me, calling me into salvation. You see, he didn't come there to judge and condemn. He wasn't mad that I was a sinner. While you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. Jesus thinks you are to die for because that's exactly what he did on the cross. He wasn't offended at my unbelief. What did he do? He came and created a moment in which faith could respond to his gift of salvation. And I heard that voice, his sound of his voice. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word or the spoken word of Christ. And so when I heard the voice of God, faith was created in me to respond to his gift of salvation. And as soon as I said, yes, this power that was on my body that was trembling, I can literally feel it going on the inside of me. I can literally feel my organs begin to tremble under this power. It gets so intense, it knocks me out. The next day I wake up and I was out for 12, maybe 13, 14 hours. And I, when I woke back up, the doctors were shaking me saying, William, William, wake up. And I wake up and they said, we, we don't know what to tell you. We've been doing tests for the past 10 hours on you. Not only are your kidneys better, not only is your liver better, but it's as if you've never done drugs before your entire life. It's like you have new organs on the inside of you. Now, even at that time, I had a little bit of wisdom on me and I knew not to tell them about the man that appeared to me. They were already trying to send me to another little white building. I didn't want to go to strap like this. you know. And I, I was like, well, I'm not going to tell them what happened. But they looked at me and said, listen, you have no reason to even be here in intensive care. They unhooked me from all the different things. And they told me, hey, please leave. <laughs> and at that time, uh, I hadn't seen my dad probably seven or eight years at that, at that time, other than a few times here and there. And our relationship was really broken. When you have a life of drugs and alcohol, you burn all the bridges that you have. Well, I, what I didn't know was my father just got saved the month before I had this encounter. And so I called my dad to come and get me at this hospital because he lived about two hours away. And he gets to the hospital, he picks me up, we go back on our way to his house. He begins to give me the father-son conversation. Say, hey, William, if you get off the drugs and I'll help you get a job, I'll help you get a home. And so we have this agreement that I'm gonna live with him for about three months. And I go there and again, I haven't mentioned anything about this man that appeared to me. I didn't know where to put this. I didn't know what to tell people about this. The only thing I know is this man appeared and all my life got changed and transformed. Well, I get to my dad's house and I realized I'm not going through any withdrawals from the drugs. And within three days, uh, one of my friends comes, comes over to hang out because I haven't seen any of my friends or family in quite some time at this point. And so my friend comes over, we're sitting on the couch and we're just having a normal conversation and all of a sudden I start speaking in different languages to it. I mean, I just want you to picture right now, you sitting on the couch having a normal conversation with your friend and all of a sudden you're like, and I didn't know what was happening to me. Well, it began to happen for five minutes. 
And my, my cousin's one of these people that carries mace on his keychain, and he pulls his mace out like this, and he's trying to spray me with it because that's how he is. And I couldn't speak English. And, and so I'm there, and he's trying to, trying to spray me with this, and I'm trying to tell him to call 911. And I'm like, and this goes on for a period of time. Well, I finally get where I can speak again, and he said, what in the world was that? I said, well, I think I need to tell you about this man that appeared to me. He says, yeah, I think you need to tell me about this man. And once I explained it to him and said his name was Jesus, this is what he said to me. He says, well, it sounds like you're a Christian. I didn't even know I was a Christian. I didn't know what it meant to be a Christian. I had never met a Christian, so I had no context to put this. And so I asked him, I said, well, what, what do I need to do? He, and he gave me the best advice I believe I've ever received in my whole life. And it is this. He says, I want you to go to Walmart. I said, Walmart? What's at Walmart? He says, well, there's a book there that you need to buy. It's a black book. It has gold letters. It says, Holy Bible. You need to buy this book, read this book, and apply this book to your life because it's going to tell you everything you need to know about being a Christian. That was the best advice that I've ever received because I thought that's what Christians were supposed to do. They were supposed to read and apply the Bible. I didn't know we were supposed to just go to church, sit there, and not do anything with it. Of course, I, I, I'm joking here. I hope you're picking up on my sarcasm of that. And so I get to Walmart. I go over to the book section and sure enough I, I find the black book like he said gold letters I grab it and I get home and I'm excited to start reading this book and I open it up and guess what it's in Shakespeare you know the King James I don't know if you've ever tried to read the King James but I was like man the man at the hospital wasn't talking like this he didn't show up and say oh brother we're out there he, you know he wasn't speaking like that and so I, I'm like man Christians are complicated what do I need to do I go back to Walmart, I find another translation, the NIV, and I get home and I open it up. And in Genesis chapter one, I see that there's a good God that's made a good world and for man out of his good image to be in divine fellowship with him. And all of a sudden the presence and the power of God right there in my home. The same presence that I felt, the hospital was right there. And I just began to devour the word of God. I read the entire Bible in about 40 days. Well, over the course of those 40 days, I received a letter from the hospital and I had a $55,000 hospital bill that was mysteriously paid for in full. When I went to uh, the hospital, when I overdosed, I had drugs in my pocket, so I had charges pending against me. They couldn't lock me up or take me to court at the time because I was in the hospital dying. So I had a court case over the course of this 40 days as well that I had to appear at. Well, I get to the courthouse and it's my turn to plead guilty or not guilty and I get before the judge and because it's a, such a small town the judge has seen me two or three times I already had two felonies at that point anyway so I was looking at a third felony possibly a three to five year prison sentence and I'm standing before there before the judge and the judge says William I've been looking forward to this because I want to make sure you do some time as soon as he makes that statement a police officer walks into the courtroom walks up to the judge whispers something into his ear. He drops his head like this, and then he, he looks back up at me. He says, William, I've just been informed that the evidence that they found on you, they have lost it, and they won't well, have anything to charge you with. And I was sitting there, I was like, well, I didn't have any drugs. I wasn't going to confess to it, you're right. <laughs> of course, I'm kind of joking there. But. And then he looked at me, he says, however, I am going to have to charge you a fine for being here because this is called charging uh, the state money. He says, you're going to have to pay a fine of $666. I had no idea what these numbers represented or symbolized at that point. Only thing that I knew is that the evidence was gone, that my, my, my father was there in the, in the courtroom with me because he took me there. And he stands up, my natural father stands up and says, I'll pay his debt in full. What is this a beautiful picture of? This is exactly what Jesus did on the cross. He took your sin. He, he took the legal demands uh, pending against you. He nailed them to a cross. He removed them. He counseled them out of the way, removed them out of your life. And you are able to become a new creation because of what Jesus did in your court case, in your courtroom scene. Jesus has disarmed and dismantled every demonic power and principality in regards to you. And so I walk out of this 
courtroom that day just overwhelmed with the goodness of God, overwhelmed with how much He's already doing in my life. And that began a journey of me really pursuing Jesus with everything that I am. And so I want to take a moment and I want to pray for you. If you're watching this right now and you're, and you're struggling with your relationship with God, I'm here to tell you, God loves you and He wants to be intimately involved with you. If you're watching this right here and you're saying, William, I, I, I've been a Christian for years, but I've always been afraid to be a witness or to speak to someone. I'm gonna pray for boldness to come upon you because I'm gonna let you in on a secret. By personality, I'm an introvert. I don't even like talking in front of a bunch of people, but yet God's sending me all over the world. God, by His Spirit, will give you the grace and the boldness and the courage, everything that you need to fulfill your destiny. So don't allow your personality to define your destiny. Allow what God's calling is on you to push you into that. Even like in, with Peter in Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit came upon him, he stood up with great boldness and proclaimed the gospel. And so right now, wherever you are, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. I want you to hold your hand like you're receiving a gift. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come upon those people with a fresh impartation of your spirit, with an activation of gifts, particularly in the area of boldness and courage to be a witness. For those that are struggling with their relationship with the Lord, right now is a moment for you to turn your heart toward Jesus, to surrender your heart toward Jesus. Say, Lord, I'm tired of doing it my own way. I want to surrender it all to you. And just confess Christ right now as your personal Lord and Savior. He doesn't want to control you. He wants to free you. Listen, family, I've enjoyed sharing my story with you. It's, it's one of those unusual stories, but I hope it's been a blessing for you.